Hello and welcome to Nottingham Teams Pines of Science Show 2021. I am your host, Nikki Walter, a plant science PhD student from University of Nottingham. And tonight we are in the lovely city of Nottingham for tonight's show where we'll be talking about all things plants. Before we get started, we wanted to say a big thank you to yesterday's Nottingham show, How Does a Molecule Become a Medicine? They did such a great job at bringing this show together. You can catch up on all the past Pint of Science online events on our YouTube channel, Pint of Science UK. You can also check out our website, pintofscience.co.uk, for more events and follow hashtag 20, Pint21 for more Pint of Science content. You can also use hashtag Sherlock Gnomes to ask questions after the show. We're so sad not to be in our usual collection of Nottingham City Centre pubs and bars for this year's festival, but we hope we've made up for it with our fantastic lineup of guests this evening. We've also worked hard to make tonight's show interactive and we'd love for you to get involved in the comments section. First off, please let us know where you're tuning in from. Coming up in tonight's show, we have Dr. Mark Spencer telling us about his curious experience of using plants to solve crimes. Our special guest, Charlie Dean, a performance artist currently based in Nottingham, has been collaborating with Dr. Mark Spencer on their recent artwork. Later on, we'll be showing you the video that they created exploring communication with plants as part of Pines of Science's Creative Reactions exhibition. Finally, we have the wonderful Hassa Hafiji talking to us about access to green space and how you can grow food for free from things you'd be throwing away in your kitchen. Then to finish, we will be taking questions to all the speakers from you, our wonderful audience. So get ready to comment next to this live feed during and after the talk. But before that, welcome again to our show from wherever you are in the world. Please stay in touch with us throughout the show. You can do this by using the comments section next to the live feed. We want to know where you are tuning in from and also in the theme of tonight's show, what is your favorite plant? And what is your favorite crime or murder mystery TV show? Please give us a comment and let us know. Now grab a pint or a cup of tea and let's get on with the show. Our featured guest tonight is an experienced and internationally respected botanist, forensic botanist, author and public speaker. A former curator at the London Natural History Museum which gained him an international reputation, Dr. Mark Spencer now uses his understanding of botany and landscape history to uncover clues in missing person searches and cold cases assessing how long human remains have been in situ and linking suspects to crime scenes. He has also worked with police forces up and down the country, assisting in murder and other serious crime investigations. Mark has also recently authored a book on his experiences titled Murder Most Florid. Dr. Mark Spencer, welcome to Pints of Science. Thank you very much, Nikki, and thank you for inviting me and good evening, everybody. So would you like me to start straight away, Nikki? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to my brief talk, Murder Most Florid, um, which is going to give you a little bit of insight into how I attempt to use plants to help police understand how serious crimes occur and hopefully uh, bring criminals to justice at times. Um, so first of all, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself, because um, my first great love is most definitely plants, but I'm also very fond of ducks. This is my pet duck, Daisy, uh, when I was about six years old. So my passion for plants has been throughout my whole life, and my family sort of say they don't really ever remember a time when I wasn't interested in plants. And it's illustrated works such as this famous Reverend Keeble Martin's Concise British Flora, which helped bring me into the world of plants and botany. So I've been passionate about plants throughout the whole of my life, but it's fair to say uh, I never really considered in the earlier parts of my career when I was a horticulturalist at Kew Gardens and then a field botanist working in the London area for the London Wildlife Trust and then a museum curator that I would ultimately end up working at least in part in crime scene work. So um, that came about pretty much by chance because one day I received a phone call from the police saying, Dr. Spencer, could you assist us? We have the remains of a man lying on a canal side and we'd like to know how long he has been there. And that brings us on to this idea that I want to talk about momentarily, which is the idea of plant blindness. Because one of the reasons that police forces ask people like myself and other specialists to 
attend crime scenes is because they're very often not used to dealing with the natural world outside of the human body and the human experience. They're not used to small invertebrates and they're most certainly not used to dealing with plants. So they are, when it comes to botany, often as not plant blind, as we sometimes refer to it, um, as are many other people in our society. So I spend quite a bit of time coaxing police into understanding how vegetation and plants can be useful in exploring what has happened in a crime scene. Um, and as Nikki mentioned earlier on, the three main areas that I cover are cold cases, looking for bodies in landscape, and those are without a doubt the hardest pieces of work that I do because they require lots and lots of different pieces of complicated information from mobile phone data, maps, soil science, botany, entomology, as well as what we refer to as intelligence, the witness statements and information from people. And these are many layers that have to be put into an investigation to help ensure that you're looking in the right place if you're looking for a missing person. So missing person searches are incredibly complicated, but botany can be useful in helping localise where somebody is. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So my first personal experience of working in a crime scene was about 15 years ago. And as I say, the phone went, Dr. Spencer, can you help us? And a few hours later, I was in the presence of the dead. Um, there is no way you can really prepare for that experience. Um, you only learn that you're capable of working in these conditions and with the remains of the dead through experience. Um, and you can't train as a professional botanist or in a forensic, not as a professional botanist, you cannot train as a forensic botanist, apologies. There are, as far as I know, no forensic botany courses worldwide. So I have learned on the job as I've gone along, often as not, frankly, through the knowledge and experience of other forensics experts with much more time and knowledge than me in many ways, and also people in the police forces themselves. So um, it is a fascinating world and each case I attend is different. There is very little consistency because the natural world is very diverse and plants do very, very different things in different circumstances. Now, it's fair to say that often as not when we uh, think about um, forensic science and we think about botany, maybe in crime scene um, dramas on television, uh, such as these, the CSI genre, um, people tend to think of pollen as being something that is the, the, the be all and end all of forensic botany. Pollen, work, pollen works very well for a storyline in a book or on television because um, it is something that's got a little bit of sciencey technology. You get to wear a lab coat, apparently, you've got a microscope. Those all fit into the ideas about what science is. Um, pollen is most definitely deeply useful. Um, but it swings and roundabouts, as it's all things in biology. Certain pollen types are incredibly good for localising a victim to a location or a suspect to another location, or they can be uh, quite difficult. So on the left here, we have pine spores and pine, pine strobili, rather, and producing pollen. And pine um, is wind dispersed. And therefore, the distribution of the pollen from that particular plant is going to be very far and wide. If you're trying to link a suspect to a crime scene or a victim, what you really need to find on their clothing, in their car, on a spade, is pollen from such a plant as this um, woolly thistle that is insect pollinated. Because insect pollinated um, plants, the pollen is chunkier, heavier, and doesn't move around in the landscape much more, very much. So when we're looking for pollen profiles in clothing or soil or something like that, what we're really hoping for is a species rich profile of insect pollinated plants to help us localize where the suspect may have been. Now, quite a lot of what I do is in many ways from sort of field sense, sort of tracking knowledge in many ways. Um, my familiarity of looking at plants over the last 40 or so years in Britain mean that I can look at vegetation and interpret it in ways that people who are not used to plants find, frankly, quite surprising. So, for example, this um, piece of a young horse chestnut growing through these twigs 
was part of a murder investigation where we were looking for a woman who'd been murdered by uh, a man and the police were about to remove this large pile of vegetation in the belief that her body was underneath it, that the murderer had piled the vegetation on top. Now, my botanical knowledge said straight away this was impossible because it was believed to be about six months previously and growing through these dead stems were several dozen of these young horse chestnut saplings and within the time frame that the murder was supposed to have occurred it would have been impossible to remove the twigs dig a hole put your victim in put the twigs back without damaging young plants such as this so these little environmental tells help a botanist such as myself or um, other people i work with understand time frames and human activities Similarly, things like lichens and mosses growing on branches, if they're moved by humans, they'll be out of position because they need the sunlight on the upper surface. You'll be able to get an indication of human activity and what's been happening. Now, one of the things that often comes up in conversation, both with the public and also with police forces, is that you can find a clandestine burial through a profusion of growth because the plants are feeding off the dead beneath. Now, um, plants such as the stinging nettle are what we call nitrophiles. They thrive on this, this kind of environment. Unfortunately, the story seems to be much, much more complicated than that, and studies using pig carcasses, amongst other things, because pigs are the similar weight and fat composition to us, very good proxies, show that that idea is not necessarily entirely true. So myself and some colleagues are trying to unpick and understand more in detail how plants respond to the presence of the dead underneath them. Now, my, my pet plant in crime scene work, it's fair to say, is the bramble and blackberries. Um, they are fascinating, wonderful plants, hugely diverse. We have several hundred species in this country um, and they often grow in the presence of um, human remains because they're common plants and they tend to be in places where people put murder victims, etc., etc. Now, if a body has been in a landscape or in a burial for, say, five, ten years, brambles and other plants grow over that person's remains and physically lock them into the landscape. And by understanding the growth patterns of plants such as brambles, I can help provide the police with a time frame that says what you need to be looking at is five years ago or six years ago or seven years ago. Because by looking at the structure of the vegetation and the growth of the stems, each one of these comes up once a year, you can provide the police with an estimate of how long that person has been there. Now, that can be incredibly powerful for the police in the early stages of an investigation if they are trying to work out who the person is and how long they've been there. So potentially a specialist such as myself doing forensic botany and other forms of specialist forensics can save the police time and money in an investigation because other options for them potentially are going through hundreds of hours of CCTV images, these kind of things, all going through kind of county records for missing people going back, you know, a number of decades. So but botany can provide some really useful information right at the start of an investigation. Now, uh, an area that I do quite a look on is around using vegetation fragments, not necessarily pollen. I personally don't do pollen work for various reasons of using fragments of wood, foliage, leaves, to um, uh, flowers, bits of pollen, to link people to a crime scene. So in this particular case, this is a specimen of our wild yam, black bryony, it's a diastory, it's a type of yam. And this is a herbarium specimen from a collection I made when I used to work at the Natural History Museum. And one of the reasons I've got the herbarium specimen up for is because natural history collections are incredibly important in helping us understand biodiversity around the world, but we can use them as tools for identification when doing casework such as this. Because the last thing I want as a terribly bold and brash professional scientist is to walk into a courtroom, stand in front of a judge and a jury and the barristers and say, I'm Dr. Spencer and I know more than everybody else about this, and then find I don't. So one of the days I can ways I can validate my observations about what I've identified is going, I went to the crime scene, I collected leaf fragments from clothing or material that was submitted to me. I had an idea about what the plant was, 
and then I checked my observations against these validated museum collections. So natural history collections are potentially a massively valuable resource in crime scene work. Uh, and this is a nice example of this in a case again from my former employer, the Natural History Museum. And these are um, the fragments of leaf retrieved from a man who'd tried to burn a building down. Very fortunately, the police officer who'd obviously been given a certain amount of training around you know, environmental forensics um, arrested the man, um, not at the crime scene, but uh, a few miles away, but was aware that potentially he was the cause of the crime stood him on a plastic sheet and brushed off his clothing and these three tiny leaves they're each about two millimeters long and this tiny flower fell from the man's clothing ultimately these were sent to me and my colleagues at the natural history museum we were able to identify that they were not from a british wild plant they were actually from a plant from southeast asia and australia and it proved ultimately very robust information linking the man to the crime scene and subsequently he was jailed but it's not, not always plants fungi can come into the frame as well because fungi are very distinctive in their habitat requirements and they often have spores that persist for many many years for example in soil and this relates to a case of a woman not these particular fungi i've just got them up here for a bit of pretty pretty of a woman who accused a man of sexually assaulting her now, to complicate this particular case, they were unable to use um, DNA evidence from him to demonstrate that he'd been in contact with her because they both had agreed that they had had consensual sexual activity earlier on the same day. So DNA was not going to be an option because they both agreed that that had occurred. However, she said he then assaulted her later on. So the police had to use environmental forensics and ultimately fungi and pollen spore and pollen grains but in this particular case the man was obviously aware of environmental forensics to a certain level and um, told the police no 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 i wasn't on that playing field where the crime occurred i was actually down the road in a nearby wood unfortunately for him the profile of the pollen and the pollen and the fungal spores from his footwear matched the scene where she said the crime had occurred and presented with this evidence, he confessed. Similarly, things such as diatoms can be used to link suspects to crime scenes. These are unicellular or colonial algae, and they have this extraordinary property that their outer case is made out of silica. So they can also be used because of the robustness of silica to indicate, along with other pieces of medical information, the likelihood of somebody being drowned. Because quite often in murder inquiries, a murderer will hit somebody on the back of the head, throw them into a canal and try and pass it off as accidental death. Now, tragically, in those last moments, if you do drown, in many cases, you breathe in and these diatom cells are pushed through the membranes in your lungs into your bloodstream where they lodge. So the retrieval of diatoms from your organs after death can be used as a way of identifying potential drowning. Now we can also explore plant poisoning, of course. This thing, Abrus precatorius, is one of the world's most toxic plants. It's several hundred times more poisonous than the infamous ricin used to kill the Bulgarian dissident, Georgi Markov. Um, and poor plant poisoning is sometimes used in crime scenes. Um, and I am on occasion sent the contents of people's stomachs to identify what they have eaten and what the causes were. So this is my Christmas dinner from a few years ago. And despite being cooked and then going into our digestive tract, plant tissue retains distinctive cell structures which mean we can identify people's last meals which with police intelligence can link you to a particular place you know if you went to a burger joint or something like that and you had lettuce with your meal or something like that so this kind of information can help build up an understanding of people's last meals one of the most tragic and famous examples of this was the murder of the west african boy adam in London about 20 years ago and Adam and he was given this name because to this day we don't know who he was um, Adam's dismembered torso was found in the River Thames and botanists at Kew Gardens um, examined his stomach contents 
and were able to identify, amongst other things, these two very, very poisonous plants. In particular, the calabar or deal bean, the plant on the left, is used in parts of West Africa in witchcraft and in, in sort of ritual poisonings. So there's a very strongly belief that Adam was almost certainly killed for religious and people trafficking reasons. But to this day, the case remains unsolved. Now, an area that I'm personally very, very interested in is rapidly expanding globally is how we can use DNA from the environment, eDNA, to link suspects to crime scenes. Because even something quite mundane as this pavement in Hyde Park will have a diverse microbial community. And if you can sequence the DNA in a cost-effective manner and produce the data in a way that courts and the courts can use and understand, because this is complicated science, potentially we could use eDNA to link across suspects to a crime scene and or a victim. So there's an extraordinary diversity of ways that the DNA world could expand how forensic science and forensic botany is done. Um, there's a whole load of very, very interesting work to be done, for example, around what we refer to as the necrobiome and the thanatobiome, which is understanding the microbial interactions between our remains and the soil and the organism communities that surround us as we well after we're dead. So there's much to learn still to this day. And just to finish off on one or two brief things, just to say that I've talked about um, the human experience of crime, but criminality doesn't just affect us humans. It obviously affects wildlife. We tend to hear about um, rhinos and tigers, etc. But orchids such as this very rare Chinese orchid, Dendrobium officinale, are heavily trafficked and are being pushed to extinction. And again, environmental DNA and forensics can play a part in helping reducing the impacts of international trade upon these organisms. Or we can use it in things such as veterinary health. This is my mother's rather dotty dog tear running around. And the fungus on the right, again, is just for illustrative reasons. But certainly in the UK over the last decade or so, we've had at least two new illnesses affecting dogs, which have been initially attributed to poisonous plants or poisonous fungi. And I've worked on those cases to frankly demonstrate that those options are not viable. It seems in the case of one particular uh, of one of the diseases, it's most likely a new non-native mite species which has arrived on our shores. So this has been an incredibly quick introduction into my life as a forensic practitioner. I've talked about the science but it is incredibly important to really remember that what you're dealing with is the passing of somebody, their remains and the impacts upon their family and friends. And it is, frankly, it's an extraordinary honour to work with the dead. It's not horrific. The horror is in the mind of the perpetrators. And so I will just, on that thought, move to the last slide and just say to you, we'll be coming back to questions a little bit later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for such a fascinating insight into the criminal justice system using the language of plants. You're welcome. Uh, Mark, Thank you. Mark's going to join us again after our next guest to take your questions. So now is your chance to ask him any questions you have following his talk. Uh, please just comment next to this live feed and we'll try and get through as many as possible after the interval. You can visit Mark's website at mark, markspencerbotanist.com to find out more about his work Follow him on Twitter at fungi underscore flowers and find his brilliant book, Murder Most Florid, online and in bookstores now. Now, I am very excited to introduce our Creative Reactions guest tonight, Charlie Dean. Charlie is an artist working with video, sound, performance and text. They have been collaborating with Dr. Mark Spencer to explore the ways in which we see ourselves reflected in plants as bodies through sounds, language and light. Please sit back and enjoy the fascinating artwork created by Charlie Dean. A 
I snapped my arm. Snapped it like a twig. My hand dangled like wilted leaves. I was cracked open. The skin tore. All these places hiding in darkness were suddenly engulfed with light. This new earth, scorched and tender, with light tangling inside. My blood was purples and yellows. My blood was purples and yellows. I lay down, watched it heal, watched the new valley between my forearm and hand rebuild where smooth, unceptured skin once was. With the valley hardened, I watched as this somewhat arm grew shoots. These were new arms, and these new arms grew even more arms, and those arms grew hands which slowly unfurled to reveal fingers which danced for the attention of the sun. As these branches grew from me, I noticed my eyes begin to wither. The larger I grew, the smaller my eyes became. These arms and hands, which had sprouted from me, grew taller. I was learning a new language, one which meant sight did not involve an eye. A language that placed a yellow flower next to a purple one without seeing them first. The, the eye became, became a feeling. Place. The wind carrying messages. The sunlight hitting my surfaces. Nature is an eye. A body. A brand. A tree of limbs, a body of branches, a tree of limbs. This new body. body. Scorched and tender, branches, a tree light tangling outside. My blood body, is purple and yellow. Branches, my blood is purple and yellow. Okay. 
A huge thank you to Charlie for their hard work in creating the beautiful concepts when paired with Mark. Don't forget, out, don't forget to check out Charlie's Instagram at underscore Charlie underscore Dean to see more of their pieces. If you want to find out more about creative reactions, please head over to the blog section of the Pint of Science website where you can see the pieces created in each art science collaboration and find out about the artists and scientists involved. Our final guest for, for the night is Hafsa Hafaji. Hafsa is a horticulturalist graduating from Nottingham Trent University, a green space activist and a project officer for the charity Learning Through Landscapes. She is also occasionally on BBC Radio 4's Gardener's Question Time. She is here tonight to talk about growing your own food when space, time and money are all issues. Please give a warm welcome to Hafsa Hafaji. Hello, oh, yeah. thank you for the introduction, Nikki. Um, it's so lovely to be here. Uh, that was a really wonderful talk, Dr. Spencer. It was really fascinating and inspiring, and I love the idea of eDNA. Um, yeah, so uh, my name's Afsa, and yeah, I'm here with you guys today to talk about um, growing from scraps. Something I'm really passionate about is making growing accessible for people, um, no matter what background they come from, and no matter what space they have available. I find that it's a very common term that's used it's a very common suggestion that's given to people to grow their own food whether it's to offset their carbon footprint or to um, get have more nutritious food or um, whether it's just for their general health and well-being and that's all really great stuff but it's it's not always easy because it doesn't take into consideration when someone says that to you um, perhaps your um any cultural differences so things like space any financial difficulties so things like not having enough money to um to buy plants and to have um to buy planters and to buy seeds and just things that you need to grow so what i really like doing is sharing a few tips and a few ideas um which might make that easier for people um, so I like sharing things which don't take a lot of space. So with, you can grow on your windowsill um, and also things which don't take a lot of money either. And that's where growing from scraps comes in for me. Um, whenever, people, whenever people are wanting to start to grow or are just interested in growing, the first thing I would recommend is growing from scraps because it's so easy. And it's just, it's just a thing that you, you get on the side whenever you start growing. So whenever you're sorry, not growing, but whenever you're cooking or um, making a dish, you will always end up with a few scraps. So, um, and if you don't have a compost, then they tend to just go straight into the bin. So, um, yeah, so that's what I'm gonna be sharing with you guys today. Um, spring onions are my on, on the top of the list of things that I would, uh, I would recommend to grow from scraps. They are really easy. Um, they're very fast growing um and they are um also very cold tolerant so over winter if um if you're growing on a windowsill which gets quite cold my windowsills do then it does really well over winter as win winter as well or even if you do have a planter outside then they're just a really great veg to grow um so spring onions um you've got your green bit and then you've got your white bit at the end um you can see at the end you you have your roots um coming out at the end and what you want to do is um, you normally start cutting your spring onions from this end so as you're cutting you want to make sure you leave around an inch 
an inch of um, white root. Um, and I'm just going to do that for all of them. And the idea is we want to bury at least we're going to bury half of that inch into the soil and the other half will be sticking out. Um, so, yeah, this is a really great root veg to um, to grow to to grow from scraps. A lot of I'm going to demonstrate another another um, I'm going to also demonstrate lettuce. And that also has a a root um, like a root uh, basil plate at the base that you can see here. The roots aren't visible on lettuce, but they are on spring onions. Um, but there are lots of veg which have that root base visible. So things like leeks are also a really great um, crop to grow from scraps. That's something I, I went out to look for leeks um, at the supermarket, but it seems like it was a very popular day for leeks because I just couldn't find any. I went to two supermarkets. Um, but leeks are also really great and they grow very similar to spring onions. So um, I'll show you how to do spring onions and you can kind of replicate that if you want to grow your leeks too. So the first thing I want you want to be doing is just cutting that inch of uh, white root. Um, I'll just quickly do that now. I'm just very passionate about making, growing and and just gardening in general. Ooh, I've lost one root already. Um, making it accessible for people because one in five people in the UK don't have access to a green space or any sort of um, park or garden. And it's, it's a very large um, number in the population. So, so I feel like growing needs to be made easier, whether it's giving people more, giving people community gardens to go and grow in or um, having, if you live in a flat, for example, having a communal space where people can go in and grow food in, in vegetable planters. Um, and I think that's, that's something that needs to become more universal. And we need to, we need to see funding and money going into things like that, because I think it would be amazing if we all would have a space where you get to meet your neighbors and you get to grow um, veg and you get to socialize. And it does, it is really great for your health and well-being. So having a space like that, I think would be amazing. Um, so I've cut my little roots. I have cut them quite, I've, I've cut some of them a little, a little too short, but that's all right. Um, so I've got, how many have I got here? I've got seven over here. I'm just gonna put them right there. One thing you can do, and I sometimes do do this, is put your little roots in water. So um, it's there, so that with the, with the roots facing down, so you just wanna put them in a glass of water. And you can do that, uh, it's just a shallow glass with some, with some water in there, and it will grow very happily in there. Um, and I do do that sometimes. I tend to do that over winter because um, it grows faster when I put it in the water. But for me, I like to think about, I, I don't want to make too many steps for myself. And also when I share with people, I want to make it as simple as possible. So doing it in water is great. It will grow really fast. And you'll probably see lots of people who do grow spring onions in water. But one thing to remember is that after a little while, plants do need nutrients and the nutrients water doesn't hold many nutrients and it was just a vessel kind of for the roots to grow but as they start growing as these roots start developing they will start looking for nutrients so by planting it directly in some soil you're already kind of you're already giving them those nutrients so you don't need to worry too much um about um uh moving them from the water and then into some soil afterwards i'm going to show you guys i should i'm supposed to show you this at the beginning but i'm going to show you an example of some spring onions that have already been growing. Um, this, these are some spring onions. They look a little, they look a little thin now. These have been growing for, I've got around five harvests from these, um, and these are looking a little bit stronger. And I've harvested these around two to three times now. And um, in water, if I was to grow this in water, I would only get around two harvests before they start looking really tired. So I like to put them straight into some soil and um, they will they will grow very nicely and I'll get at least five harvests from them. So next thing you want to do is you want to start putting them, putting your little roots that you've just cut into some sort of growing medium. 
Um, I've got some coir here. So coir is made out of coconut husk and it's a good, it's a relatively good alternative to peat um, because I would definitely recommend that you have a peat alternative, peat free um, growing medium. Um, what I also really like doing is I like upcycling things from my recycle bin and using that to grow in. So this is a strawberry punnet. I literally just rifled through my recycling bin right before this and I just looked for something that I could grow in and I found this strawberry planter, strawberry punnet, sorry. Um, the spring onions here, I grew these. These are in a grape punnet and the great thing about these is, is that they already have holes at the back. Um, so you'll notice that they, they already have holes in there, probably can't see up there. Um, so there's no, you don't really need to think about drainage, it's going to go straight out. Um, what you want to do next is, by just, um, yeah, so you just want to fill your little growing container, whatever it is. You don't need to have too deep of soil, too deep of a container. Um, I'd say this is around 10, 6, 7 centimetres maybe. Um, it doesn't need to be very deep. Um, the grape punnet is quite deep. It doesn't need to be that deep. And yet, yeah, you just want to fill that right to the top. I really like upcycling. It just it's just a great way of of making use of items which which you which are so single use and um, just giving them that uh, another lease of life kind of thing. And it's really um, it just makes me feel a bit better as well. So. I, I also use things like loo rolls as um, uh, planters, as little pots for my veg that I grow. So I've got all of my uh, cucumbers in loo rolls right now. Um, so yeah, I've just filled that right to the top. I'm gonna tap it down lightly to make sure there's no air pockets because roots will not like any air pockets. And really straightforward. If you've had these in water for a few days to give it a little bit of a um, speed up a little, then then same thing applies. Just take them out of the water and all you want to do is place them. Hopefully you can see this well, but just you can use your finger. I'm just using the knife here and just poke them in one by one. I'll just show you guys how I'm doing that. You can plant them quite close together. I don't have many, so they are getting a bit of space. But if you plant them around a centimetre apart, that is fine. They're getting around an inch here. So I'm just going to show you this. I've done four of them already. I've got a little bit poking out. Um, it's not equal. Some are further in than the others, and that's fine too. Um, another, another great thing about growing is that plants aren't, aren't too fussy, um, especially veg. I find that they don't mind very much. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to poke the rest in. The last one. So I've managed to fit two, four, six. I managed to fit eight in here. I could definitely get um, at least twelve. Um, it doesn't need this much space. And that is literally it. I'm gonna. I'll just water this now under the sink, under the tap. Uh, just sprinkle it because they'll want to shuffle around a bit because there's no roots that are holding them in place yet. Um, and yeah, that's literally it. And then I will cut this up and use it in some sort of food. Um, I've got this really um, lovely dish I like to make with um, chicken and spring onions. So I'll probably be making that tomorrow. So that is growing scrap from scraps with spring onions. Um, another, another bit I like to do is, like I mentioned, um, a lot of crops, a lot of veg with like a root sorry, a basil plate, like that a flat plate at the bottom. Leeks is definitely one of them. Uh, lettuces. Um, yeah, those are the top main ones. Spring onions, I would just go for first because there's no faff with those. Things like lettuce, for example, I'm going to show you a, a, a growing fail. Um, this is a lettuce that I've had growing um, for at least two, three weeks. And I was growing this um, just in some water because they, they do do better if you put them in a little bit of water first. And one thing I realized was um, as I was watering, I'd asked my sister to do some watering for me and she was watering directly on top. And that what happens is the water went in, to, in between these leaves here and it's just caused it to rot a little. So it's not really growing anymore. 
um, and it's just rotting now. So one thing to remember when you're growing uh, things like lettuce is to avoid watering directly on top of the actual cut piece. So, um, because that might cause it to rot. So yeah, this is just a little, I forgot, this is called little gem, baby gem lettuce that I've got here. And all I'm literally gonna do is just cut that back, the back root basil plate off. Ideally, you'd be removing most of your leaves first before you do this, so it's just not good. The leaves are just gonna open up on me. Um, and yeah, I've got a little piece here. Um, that's the back, there we go. So what this will do now is I'll put this in some water, remember, remind myself and people are tell, tell to look after it, uh, not to water straight on top. And, um, and yeah, that's basically it. It'll, it'll start growing its um, leaves. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my top tips for growing from scraps. I hope you found that useful. And I would definitely recommend start with your spring onions on a windowsill um, and you will definitely get some really great results and at least five harvests from them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hafsa, for highlighting some really important aspects there of green space privilege. Um, it's so easy to take the space that we have around us for granted. I also can't wait to try that spring onion trick. They look so great in that terracotta pot. You can follow Hafsa on Instagram at Hafsa Hafaji for more tips, grow alongs and foraging. So before we begin our Q&A, let's head over to the comments section. So we've got Hi from The Hague from Hannah. And in terms of favourite TV shows, Bones seems to be a big one. I think a couple of people have actually been talking about that on the feed. Then we've got Kerry from Colchester. My favorite plants at the moment are Sansevieria. So that's a mother-in-law's tongue. I have a couple of them as well. They're really easy to look after. Uh, and her favorite TV show is How to Get Away with Murder. It's great to see so many of you watching the show and interacting with us. Uh, we'll now welcome back Mark and Hafsa who will answer some of your questions. Hi there. Hi Hafsa, hi Mark. Hello. Hi Hafsa, nice hi. to meet you. You too. <laughs> so we have one uh, from Demetra here, um, I think for Mark. So she says, thanks for the fascinating talk. In terms of molecular work, I am assuming it involves a lot of DNA extractions, PCR and sequencing. Is it you Mark that decides what laboratory techniques need to be used? So, Dimitri, yes, the underlying processes you've just explained of DNA extractions and PCR and sequencing is eDNA is essentially the same as all the, those other approaches in those core parts. The situation at the moment in the UK is that it is not, apart from one or two uh, essentially small pieces of work, being used as standard protocols in crime scene work. Um, we've got a way to go yet in terms of training for police forces in this country about how we can use environmental forensics and particularly DNA work in crime scene work. And there are still hurdles around ensuring that we can drive down costs because UK police forces are very challenged financially these days to ensure that the protocols are cost effective and will um, work sufficiently well for the courts um, for the courts um, scenario to understand and get this information past um, witnesses and uh, judge and all through the jury, so everybody understands it. It's complicated science, as I'm sure you know from what your query says. So we're away off it, unfortunately, but. The research which is happening globally strongly indicates it will become a very powerful tool in the future for criminal work, probably globally, will potentially have significant uses in illegal trade globally, potentially in human trafficking, international terrorism, as well as those those core things of murder investigations in this country. So 
scientific potential is and, and forensic potential is massive. We're just not quite there yet. Sorry for that rather long rambling answer. No, thank you so much, Mark. I think it's um, really interesting hearing how it's linked, your scientific background is linked to, um, I suppose, money issues in our society and culture with peace and everything. So thank you. Uh, so Tam asks, uh, probably one for Hafsa, can we grow bell peppers from their seeds? It's a great question. Um, yes, you can. However, um, it's very similar to things like tomatoes where you could grow them from their seed, but it's not always certain you'll end up getting a fruit. So you might not end up getting a pepper or a tomato because sometimes these, these plants are genetically modified, their seeds are genetically modified for them not, uh, not to then reproduce and create new plants um, to, create new, to create new fruits. So um, you can give it a try um but it may or may not work it's a great experiment so i definitely recommend if you just give it a go um the other thing about sorry sorry half so i was going to say the other thing about peppers is they are certainly in our climate even in good weather they're slow growing and slow maturing plants so if you're going to have a bash at it here start your seedlings off in january february on a warm windowsill um, and you will need to continue if you if you have got outside space have a warm corner if you're very 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 lucky um a greenhouse or a space where you can have something like that so they are more challenging because of those issues yeah that's both great advice i've uh, tried peppers in the past and they just take forever yeah and i think another thing for beginners because plants like peppers are quite challenging sometimes is trying and going with Hafsa's idea if you want to grow something slightly different um it's going to be entertaining and easy if you've got some um dried pulses in your cupboard um some of the haricot beans basically they're french beans and things like that try a few of those in a, in a window box um and see what you get yeah definitely that's a great idea actually i've never thought of doing the dried ones and they're very quick to grow as well. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions? So one from Hannah Nana um, regarding environmental DNA. Yeah. How would these sort of localized profiles be made, maintained and or monitored for changes? So one of the things about environmental DNA is it's potentially extremely localizable. When, if we've got the core protocols and the approach and techniques working um some preliminary work i did at the natural history museum and other colleagues at the natural history museum is if you do even a swab of a wall um the microbial diversity from one part of the wall to the next will often be very very different um, a soil sample can have uh, thousands of um, what we call operational taxonomic units which is shorthand for species or that we don't know what the names are um, so you there is great diversity in soils which means potentially once you've got the protocols there you can do some great work in localizing it the challenges are also not around only about the extraction and the management but the preparation and storage of the samples because if you are collecting a soil sample you move it into a new environment like you know your the back of your police car and then the fridge and the laboratory microbial communities change really quickly because bacteria breed really fastly really fast so we the protocols for how you manage this kind of material and um, has to be sorted out as well so that we stabilize and stop uh, uh, an environmental sample such as this um, we understand the challenges scientifically it's balancing the science with the the budgets the accessibility and getting it into the court is this something that you think will happen uh in the future in the near future i think i am I, I certainly i was talking to somebody recently i believe it has actually already been used in a few cases globally um and we are i think we're on the brink it, it's driving down the money a little bit more because DNA sequencing has dropped hugely in cost from 20 years, 30 years ago, um, compared to what it is now. 
it's it's getting those kind of pipelines worked through um and again but it will depend upon the jurisdiction you know some countries are more um on the mark and more advanced in their attitudes towards environmental forensics other countries for all sorts of complex resource reasons are not necessarily so so it's a patchy pattern globally thank you thank you mark um i actually have a quick question as well uh if possible um i was going to ask you both what was the route into your current careers we have a lot of students here so i think um they would appreciate some insight into that so hafsa would you like to go first yeah sure um so for me i did a degree at in horticulture and nottingham trent so with Nikki um, uh, and um, yeah for me I it was more of a grad I finished university I finished college sorry no idea what I wanted to do but I started to grow because I got an allotment um, and and yeah it's just horticulture just seemed like a like the thing for me and I did the degree and um, I, I followed a garden design route um, with a interest in creating spaces creating the urban green spaces um, and that's led on to me being passionate about increasing access to green spaces um, and also um, working and in creating green spaces with young people at the moment uh, in schools. Um, but yeah, do you agree for me? <laughs> um, my career, I don't think I've necessarily had an organised career. I've ricocheted from chance events to opportunity, I think, in my life. And I think there's something clearly with the way that we um, our jobs market works these days, we all have to embrace. So um, I think you, I've, you can't formally train as a forensic botanist. And in fact, actually, because of the economics of that at the moment in this country, I do a lot of other stuff. So um, writing, lecturing, training and quite a bit of traditional field botany. So I have contracts going out doing surveying work in various parts of southern Britain for um, private landowners and also for local authorities doing habitat condition assessments and stuff like this. So um, you make your career up from the opportunities and a bit of chance, it's fair to say. Um, I, When I was young, a bit like Hafsa, you know, when I was, well, way before kind of, you know, being a, a functioning adult, I thought my future would be in gardening. I grew up in the 70s, the era of Percy Thrower, um, and for me, it was gardening. And then you came to the realisation a bit later on that the world of plants is many other things. Um, and it was by chance, actually, well, not, that I ultimately ended up um, take, doing a degree in botany. But I very nearly ended up becoming a personnel officer in human resources. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark and Hafsa. Um, we've probably got 30 seconds left. So I... Uh, could you give one piece of advice for anyone who's trying to get more into plants? Buy a hand lens, because when you look at plants through a hand lens, you'll go, wow. <laughs> um, for growing plants, I would just say start small, microgreens, herbs, things on your windowsill, growing from scraps, start small. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. That's both some great advice. And I haven't got a hand lens, so I'm definitely going to get one. Five pounds and they'll change your outlook on the world. <laughs> I really place. should have one as a plant scientist. Yeah. So thank you, Mark and Hafsa. And thank you to our wonderful audience for sending in so many great questions. Uh, that wraps up our show for this evening. Thank you so much to you, our audience, for joining us this evening. And a massive thank you to our brilliant speakers, Dr. Mark Spencer, Hafsa Hafaji and our creative reactions artist, Charlie Dean. Our next show coming from Nottingham is The Art of Mental Health Beyond Boring Papers on Thursday from 7 p.m. For details of this show, alongside more events and Pints of Science fun, please head over to our website, pintofscience.co.uk. If you've enjoyed the show, please let us know on our Instagram or Twitter, which is STEM on Knots, or by using the hashtag Sherlock Gnomes. Thank you very much for watching this evening and have a great rest of your nights.